quality that women bring to the table. I would say EQ. The ability to multitask. Women are, some may call, a little more organized. Instinctly, they may understand the people better. We like being perfect and uh, we are our worst critiques. Women basically don't wear masks. They don't feel the need to walk into the office and say, hey, today I'm going to play tough. Not wearing masks means being transparent and upfront. Not acting tough translates to being consultative and pragmatic. And both of these traits have become increasingly important to a leadership in a world that's being tossed around in the crests and troughs of a continuing crisis. And it is probably this crisis that is creating an opportunity for change for working women. Hello and welcome to What Women Really Want. I'm Shireen Ban. This week on the show, we're going to be looking at why there is a premium placed on what are now being called the feminine traits of leadership. What exactly are these traits and how can companies benefit by inculcating them in both their male and female leaders? The best leaders are the ones who are humble, self-effacing. Uh, and I think that is one quality that women always had. Also on the show, we look at the duality that comes into play when women negotiate. Somewhere there is a sense in our minds probably that negotiating for terms etc. could be a detractor from what we really bring to the table. And some ideas on what women can do to strike a better deal for themselves. Think about your mission, your vision, not just yourself and it makes it a whole lot easier. A post-mortem of the 2008 financial tsunami points to the crisis of transparency. A crisis of irrational risk-taking and competitiveness exaggerated by pursuit of short-term results at the expense of long-term goals. As bank after bank collapsed, the men at the helm, who only a year earlier were celebrated for their dynamism, were now criticized for perceived hedonism. A study from Tufts University juxtaposed these two Time magazine covers from 1999 and 2010. The paper argued that the use of words like sheriff to describe the new regulators, who were all women, fueled the wild, reckless, undisciplined cowboy image of U.S. finance. So what emerged as the counterpoint to the archetypical competitive, aggressive male was the archetypical nurturing, cautious female, and a premium was placed on these feminine traits. Meet John Gazema. Over the last two years, he's traveled the world twice and has been collating survey results from over 60,000 respondents to write his book, The Athena Doctrine, Why Women and Men Who Think Like Them Will Rule the World. In a world where um, there's far um, more of a premium placed on ethics and accountability and transparency, along with the rise of a social economy and social media, a lot of the, the traits that um, could be applied to what you would say are feminine are things like openness, collaboration, sharing credit with others, and sort of building and doing consensus. So oftentimes, you know, decisive is important, we saw that, but it was also this idea of being able to put yourself out there. Um, we saw in our data, you know, the idea that it was important for leaders to truly show their personal sides. And I think that's going to be an incredibly important premium placed on leadership. For instance, Gazima describes Paul Polman of Unilever as a leader who understands the Athena doctrine of moving away from window dressing to actually taking action. Paul is just this incredible visionary. I mean, he is thinking, I believe, you know, 10, 15 years out ahead of what a, what a CEO is thinking about, thinking truly about sustainability and, and the role that a corporation has on this planet. And I think that's a big, a big challenge is how do you move from corporate reputation as sort of window dressing, which means you're saying you're doing something versus actually really doing it. We spoke to women leaders in India and asked them to identify these feminine traits in themselves. And here's what they're thinking. There was the stereotype uh, leader, the very uh, old leaders used to be brash, aggressive. You know, but, but those, that myth has been broken. If you read the recent management books, one of them is Good to Great. Uh, you will see they talk about how uh, the best leaders are the ones who are humble, self-effacing. Uh, and I think that is one quality that women always had. As a business leader, you're dealing with a younger workforce. 
typically you will be dealing with a company which is global, which has offices all over the world. So therefore, leadership really requires you to be able to be comfortable and manage all these differences while at the same time creating that core uh, for an organization, be it themes or be it values that bind the company together. And there I think there are certain qualities that come more naturally to women. These are qualities like having a consultative style, uh, uh, taking people along, uh, communication skills, the ability to deal with ambiguities, I think, uh, and, and, and finally and most importantly, the ability to multitask. Smart women are intuitive. And intuitive women know when not to do things and when to do something. We tend to be less interested in having small victories all the time. See how I won, see how I showed him, see how I showed her. At least the more mature women don't get into that. I think that's the additional factor we bring to the table. We're sort of less threatening. A man would look at his workforce as, I, this is where I am, this is where I have to be, and this is the quickest way. So it's a very uh, mathematical and a very um, you know, unilateral view, this is the road and this is how I have to go and my car can go at 180 kilometers, so I pelt on it. Women on the other hand will say, this is the road, this is where I go, these are the milestones in between, let them cross it at the correct time, let everybody be on the bandwagon and the moment you look at the bandwagon, obviously your speed is a little bit uh, full. But that doesn't mean to say that women, you know, get lost in issues, they are very effective, you know, they will manage this inclusion. Um, and they will be very resourceful and they will manage to get the results. I mean, women are, I think, very result-oriented. So the net result that you want would be achieved. I would feel with less stress on the rest of the team. Now, some behavioral psychologists say that we're falling into the old trap by classifying these new desirable traits of leadership as feminine because doing this only reinforces stereotypes and tends to pit men and women against each other. A more constructive approach for management is to think bilingually. We believe that men and women are quite different, that they bring complementary skills to the table, uh, and it's absolutely essential for companies in the 21st century to understand the languages and preferences of both men and women, both inside organizations as employees, but especially outside as customers, and be able to respond to them bilingually. This topic of gender is often seen uh, as a nice to have, as a social responsibility issue. It's not often framed for senior leaders as a real business opportunity for their businesses. And here the numbers speak for themselves. A pre-crisis study by Catalyst in 2007 found that businesses with a greater proportion of women on their boards outperformed rivals in terms of both return on equity as well as sales. Look at that picture on your screens. And this isn't just a pre-crisis phenomena where all types of corporations were buoyant. In fact, a study by Credit Suisse Research Institute that undertook a like-for-like -like comparison of companies over a six-year period starting 2005 found that organizations with at least one woman on the board outperformed those with no women on the board on the net income growth parameter and those numbers speak for themselves. And most of this outperformance has come in the period post-2008 when the macro environment deteriorated and volatility increased. Diverse teams are more innovative than homogeneous teams. And if I'm trying to, on paper, create a diverse workforce, by making everyone a clone, I've defeated the purpose. Everyone, male or female, or has their unique strengths, their unique individuality, and that is what comes together and makes a diverse, high-performing team. I think men in the team are very, they are good at a single focus whereas the women are super and multitasking. That's one big difference that I notice. And you need both because uh, you need the width and the depth. Women are, if I may call, a little more organized than the men folk are, for example. So if you need a structured approach, I find that my women team members are a little better at it than the men folk. The men folk do a decent job too. Um, uh, when we're sitting on a negotiating table, which is what is central to our work, 
I find there is a degree of a semblance of civility, if I can use that, which the presence of women brings about. So it doesn't get as aggressive, though very quietly I have noticed that some of the women can be very, very aggressive. You know? But they have a far quieter style to it. But being quiet about one's ambitions is not always desirable. It can lead to a disregard of one's ambitions and worth an overlook of one's abilities. I'm actually reminded of a statement made not by somebody I was negotiating with, but somebody I was talking about in the course of my career. And they said, to you, how does it matter what increment you get? You, your husband earns. That's the mindset you go into a discussion on, for example, whether it's a promotion, whether it's your own remuneration, or anything that you're asking in terms of a budget, for example. You go into it, this mindset exists. So you have to fight it first within yourself and you know, say that, okay, I am going to be out there and I'm going to ask for it and I think my personality profile in any case was, was never reticent so I probably didn't face it as much I the little hump I had to get over was probably lower than many other women do so because I do notice that women have a hang-up about uh, you know going in asserting and asking as such what is it that holds women back from asking for things for themselves are women conscious of doing this let's find out on the other side of this break do women negotiate for their salaries? Perhaps they are not so vociferous about it. Okay, decent salary, but this suits me, but that suits me. So the aggression at uh, middle management and senior management per se reduces. I think women are very good negotiators. I think it's it's very fundamental in our psyche. We are always negotiating for everything. I mean, for centuries, women have been negotiating in their homes, for their families. I mean, even historically, women have played a role in negotiating for their men, even in wars. And uh, women have always sort of got along through negotiations. Women's skills at... Um, playing this role um, historically you know there but um, uh, do women negotiate for their salaries perhaps they are not so vociferous about it Rajshree's observations hit the nail on the head women tend to be better negotiators when they are in an advocacy role which means when they're negotiating on behalf of others and not so good when they have to speak for themselves or ask for themselves in an experiment conducted on a batch of graduating MBA students at Carnegie Mellon University, Linda Babak found that male graduate students secured starting salaries 7.6% higher than her female graduate students. And this was because in general, men asked for a pay rise while the women accepted their offer letters. So why does this happen? Why do women find it so hard to ask for what they want at the workplace? We caught up with Joanna Bosch, a director with McKinsey & Company. She's been leading the research on working women for many years now to find out what holds women back on the negotiating table. There are three things in there. Number one, not everybody knows what they really want. And women often are more torn and think more about it. In fact, our research shows that women do have ambition at the same levels of men pretty much when they start out. It doesn't shift until we have several children and we start to let go of that ambition in favor of a more holistic look at success. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is that women like to please. We love to retain relationships. And so when you ask for something, that's a little bit of a conflict between you and the person that you're asking. And so women have a tendency to say, I do not want to risk that relationship. So I'm not going to ask. The third issue is that when a woman stands up and says, hey, my work is good, then everybody around her says, well, she's bragging. And that's because we're not used to hearing women show their ambition. So we, in fact, don't praise them for that. We ask them to be more modest. And when she's not rewarded for trying, there are compromises that happen. For instance, she might not want to take the attention away from her work by asking for a pay hike or promotion. You do not want anything to detract uh, from the fact that you want to prove your mettle. 
So you don't want any other factor to sort of come in the way and say, okay, maybe she's doing this for A and B and not just A, you know. So somewhere there is a sense in our minds probably that the, uh, you know, negotiating for terms, etc. could be a detractor from what we really bring to the table. Others feel overly grateful to companies for allowing them to leave to manage their work and life and as a result consciously compromise when negotiating for themselves. And that, that's a choice that the woman takes that okay, I'm not you know, getting the highest percentile that I could get but there are so many other factors that are being taken care of. So it's sort of a compromise that is struck um, at the negotiation table so you don't go gunning for the promotion, the top job or the highest uh, salary in the batch or something like that. You know, you say, okay, decent salary, but this suits me, but that suits me. So the aggression at uh, middle management and senior management per se reduces. So how can companies approach this situation? Aviva Wittenberg Cox, the best-selling author of How and Why Women Mean Business and the CEO of the London-based consultancy 21st, says that organizations must drop the let's fix the women approach. Women's differences are always framed as something they're doing wrong and they should fix. If companies continue to promote only people who want to be promoted uh, and who visibly and actively raise their voices and push for it, there will continue to be a gender bias in their promotions and they lose out on performance that may simply be expressing themselves slightly differently. Organizations need to become much better meritocracies by recognizing that there are different leadership styles and that women may be less pushy, but they certainly aren't performing less well. But while Aviva is vehemently against a let's fix women's approach, there are skills women and men can use to make it easier to talk about these issues. Joanna Bosch calls it centered leadership and we'll get you a how-to guide on the other side of this break. Keep watching. Start with understanding what you really want and understanding that the rules are you get to ask for it. The second thing is reframing. Ask yourself, what's the worst that can happen if I go ahead and ask for this? No one gets to the corner office by sitting on the side, not at the table. And no one gets the promotion if they don't think they deserve their success or they don't even understand their own success. Put your hand up, speak sooner. Don't wait for someone else to have, to steal your, your, your great thought. If you have to negotiate to get your salary, there is an issue with that relationship between employer and employee. You shouldn't have to shout harder to be recognized. And in a sense, the confidence to speak up comes after one has spent some time in the cutthroat environment of a corporate office. But for some men and women who are not necessarily flamboyant and outgoing, that doesn't come very naturally. What can they do to develop this skill? And no, we're not talking about a personality overhaul. The centered leadership approach is more of a how-to guide that helps people reorient societal expectations to gel with their personal needs. Joanna Bosch. Over to you. We teach that as part of something that we call centered leadership at McKinsey. We, and the way it's, it, it, you build this in yourself is to start with understanding what you really want and understanding that the rules are you get to ask for it. The second thing is reframing. Ask yourself what's the worst that can happen if I go ahead and ask for this because I really want it. The worst that can happen is that the person is displeased with you or maybe you would even lose your job and if you were to lose your job you will get another job because you're talented the third piece of this is have you built a professional relationship with the person that you're asking in fact does that person know what you want and is that person believing that you deserve more and that you're in fact performing at a very high level creating that relationship which is up to each of us to do, is possible. The fourth thing is to think about your hope. What's the upside of asking for what you want? 
gosh, if I could do this next job, then I can help so many more people. I can be in an area where I use my strengths and I will do such a great job for the company and produce results that will help this company. Now I have hope. I know why I'm asking. And finally, doing it with energy actually releases more energy. So we might feel that fear, but we can use that fear creatively to make sure that we are in fact standing for what we believe in, asking for what we really know we want with the hope that if we get it, we will, we will grow, we will contribute, and indeed, all the people around us will also benefit. So think about your mission, your vision, not just yourself, and it makes it a whole lot easier. The crux is to bring positive energy to one's work and not think of it as just a job that brings in the paycheck, but to find personal meaning and fulfillment. That's it then on this week's edition of What Women Really Want. Next week on the show, we find out if Indian manufacturing has made room for women in India.